Feels great to be back. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we look at internal medicine. We look at a very important topic, which is Reynolds disease. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we're back to doing regular videos on the channel. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Here's a warm-up question. A single best answer. Which of the following is a cause of central cyanosis? A. Exposure to code. B. Heart failure. C. Reynolds phenomenon. D. Right to left cardiac shunts. E. Shock. You may pause the video at this moment, write down your answer, screaming at the screen, and I will give you the answer at the end of the lecture. So when you talk about Reynolds disease, you can also refer to it as Reynolds syndrome or Reynolds phenomenon you're basically going to be having these vasospasms that are affecting the arteries in parts of the hand. And this will be in a response to certain things, certain triggers, such as the cold, emotional stress. And often this causes reversible discomfort. It causes color changes, which may include pallor, cyanosis, erythema, or a combination of the three in one or more digits. So remember that most of the symptoms are going to be relieved by applying heat to the area because cold is a trigger so it means heat will make it feel better and if there is no underlying cause of the condition you refer to it as Reynolds disease so remember that the disorder is usually bilateral with the fingers affected more commonly than the toes however you may have other parts of the body such as the nose the tongue being affected and it's going to be accounting for about three to five percent of the population and women are going to be affected far much more than men and younger people are affected more than older people. What we actually believe to be the cause of Reynolds disease or Reynolds phenomenon is pretty much an exaggerated alpha-2 adrenergic response. So this is going to be stimulation of these adrenergic receptors which are found in blood vessels that results in vasospasms, although the underlying mechanism is not really known. There may be accompanying migraine headaches, variant angina, and even pulmonary hypertension, which may suggest that these disorders are actually going to be sharing a common vasospastic mechanism. How do we classify Reynolds syndrome? It can be classified into primary Reynolds sy syndrome, which accounts for more than 80% of the cases. This one occurs without symptoms or signs of any other disease. Then you have secondary Reynolds syndrome, which is accounting for 20% of the cases. It's often secondary to something or there is an underlying disease. For example, a systemic sclerosis can be present at the initial presentation or diagnosed subsequently, and most associated disorders are going to be these connective tissue disorders. So you also have to take note that nicotine commonly contributes to secondary Reynolds syndrome, but it's often quite overlooked. What are some of these secondary causes? Like I said, most of them are going to be connective tissue disorders, so it may be mixed or undifferentiated connective tissue disease, polymyositis and dermatomyositis, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, systemic lupus erythematosus, you may also have systemic sclerosis. You may have some endocrine disorders like hypothyroidism, hematological disorders like cold agglutinin disease, polycythemia vera, neoplastic disorders like carcinoid and paraneoplastic syndromes, neurological disorders like carpal tunnel syndrome, vascular disorders like thoracic outlet syndrome, trauma which includes frostbite and vibration. You may also have some drugs like beta blockers, cocaine, Agot preparations, nicotine, and sympathomimetic drugs. What are some of the clinical features? So patients may have sensations of coldness, a burning pain, paresthesia, or intermittent color changes in one or more of the digits that is precipitated by exposure to cold, emotional stress, and sometimes even vibration. So all of these stimuli can, or all of these features can be reversed by removing the stimulus. So if you rewarm the hands, this is going to accelerate the restoration of the normal color and the sensation. And remember that the color changes are clearly demarcated across the digits. So the duration of the attack is actually rather variable, but sometimes it can last long hours. It may be triphasic, biphasic, or uniphasic. So in the triphasic type of condition, you have pallor, which is later followed by cyanosis after warming, then by erythema due to the, of course, the reactive hyperemia. 
So the vasoconstriction causes the skin to become pale. Then this is going to be followed by cyanosis due to the sluggish blood flow. Then the redness is due to the secondary hyperemia when the blood is going to be engorging these areas again. It may sometimes be biphasic where you have cyanosis and erythema, or it can be uniphasic where you have pala or cyanosis alone. And remember that these changes are often symmetrical. In chronic disease, the tissue infarction and digital loss can be actually seen. I'll show you some pictures very shortly. So Reynolds syndrome does not occur proximal to the metacarpal phalangeal joints. This is a very important thing to remember. It does not occur proximal to the metacarpal phalangeal joints. And it is most commonly affecting the middle three fingers, and it rarely affects the thumb. So the vasospasms can actually last minutes to hours, but rarely, if it's severe enough, it can cause tissue loss, especially in primary Reynolds syndrome. And remember that Reynolds syndrome secondary to connective tissue disorders may also progress to painful digital gangrene. It may also be secondary to systemic sclerosis, and this tends to cause an extremely painful infected ulcer on the fingertips. This is peripheral cyanosis that may be seen with Reynolds phenomenon. As you can see, the tips here are discolored, the bluish discoloration. Then you may have the cyanosis. You may also have these digital gangrene. As you can see, these three fingers are appearing gangrenous, especially this index finger. This is renal syndrome with pala. As you can see, there's some irregularity in the pala. You can see that the digits here, these three digits are pale. You can see that part of the thumb here is affected, but not really a common presentation. So you have this irregular pala that we're seeing. So how do we make a diagnosis? So we use a clinical criteria. So acrocyanosis also causes color change of the digits in response to code, but it differs from renal syndrome in that it is persistent, so it's not easily reversed. Well, while it's with Reynolds phenomenon, if you apply heat, it, it actually easily gets reversed. So it doesn't cause any trophic changes, ulcers, or pain with acrocyanosis. Then with examination and testing of the underlying disorders, you may want to order for an ESR or C-reactive protein, antinuclear and anti-DNA antibodies to rule out SLE, rheumatoid factor, anticentromere antibodies, anticyclic citrullinated peptide antibodies. This is for rheumatoid arthritis. Then you also should order for antiscleroderma 70 antibodies. Now, features that are going to be suggestive of primary renal syndrome include an age of onset less than 40. Two-thirds of the cases are going to be in the falling under this category. The mouth symmetrical attacks affecting both hands. These no tissue necrosis or gangrene, and there's no history or physical findings that are suggestive of any other cause. Then this is primary renal sy syndrome. And features of secondary renal syndrome, most patients are over the age of 30. They have severe painful attacks that may sometimes be asymmetric and unilateral. They tend to have ischemic lesions, and there is a history and findings that are suggestive of an accompanying disorder. Now, the management can be divided into general management and pharmacological management. General management is going to include avoiding the triggers, so wearing gloves and keeping warm. If they do smoke, tell them to stop smoking. Stress relaxation techniques such as biofeedback or counseling can also help with relaxation. Then pharmacological management with primary Reynolds syndrome, we do give vasodilators, which are the calcium channel blockers. The headaches is a major side effect with these drugs. So we can give extended release nifedipine, 60 to 90 milligrams once a day, or amlodipine, 5 to 20 milligrams once a day orally, or philodipine 2.5 to 10 milligrams once orally, twice a day rather, and israpidine, which is pretty much 2.5 to 5 milligrams orally, twice a day. Prazosin can also be given once or twice a day at 1 to 5 milligrams orally. Some topical nitroglycerin paste can also be used, and you may actually it may be quite effective, but there's no evidence that supports routine use of these drugs, especially with the, uh, the pentoxyphylin, which is 400 milligrams orally twice or three times a day with meals. So remember contraindications for these drugs, or contraindicated drugs rather, include beta blockers, clonidine, agot preparations, as these can cause vasoconstriction and they may worsen the symptoms. With secondary Reynolds syndrome, you may also give calcium channel blocker the same doses as above, Prazosin also the same doses as above, antibiotics, analgesics, and often patients actually require surgical debridement with the ischemic ulcers. Low-dose aspirin can actually help prevent thrombosis, but theoretically it may worsen the vasospasms due to prostaglandin inhibition. IV prostaglandins like alprostadil 
appear to be effective and may actually be an option for patients that have ischemic digits. However, the drugs are not widely available and their role in the disease is not really defined. So you have to take note that cervical and local sympathectomy is controversial and it is reserved for patients with progressive disability and responsive to all other, me all other measures or other drugs, including treatment of the underlying cause. If all of these fail, then you can actually go for cervical or local sympathectomy. So remember that sympathectomy is going to be abolishing the symptoms and it may cause relief that may last only one to two years. Coming back to our warm-up question, which of the following is a cause of central cyanosis, A, exposure to code, B, heart failure, C, Reynolds phenomenon, D, right to left cardiac shunts, E, shock. As you can see, most of these other things are going to be causing peripheral cyanosis and not really central cyanosis. But with the right to left cardiac shunts, which are the cyanotic congenital heart diseases, these are going to be presenting with central cyanosis. I really hope you enjoyed this video on Reynolds phenomenon. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. See you in the next video. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, to Zambia and beyond, bye-bye.